Good afternoon, everybody. Including everyone hiding in the shadows. Welcome to this launch uh, of uh, Independent Venue Week for the 10th anniversary of Independent Venue Week, which takes place at the start of next year. Thank you very much, uh, Nuha Ruby Ra, uh, for opening the proceedings for us. I like an early gig, don't you? Love an early gig. Uh, yeah, I thought I saw Yard Act at the 100 Club doing one of their in store, out store things uh, earlier on this year on stage at half 12. Oh, it's perfect. It's brilliant. I mean, it ruined the rest of my day. It was a fantastic gig. Uh, anyway, this year marks, uh, as some of you will already know, uh, as I say, it's the 10th anniversary of Independent Venue Week, uh, which uh, is the it's a sort of national celebration, but with a, a local feel. Uh, its aim is to shine a light on well, hundreds of uh, small independent grassroots venues uh, around the country. Uh, the date, I'm sure you already know, it starts on Monday, the 30th of January, uh, runs till February the 5th, uh, and what we're going to try and do in the next hour or so, 50 minutes, uh, is explain a little bit more about what it's about uh, and who's involved, uh, and we'll be talking to some of the people who are taking part. Uh, the headlines, I guess, for any reporters here, or if you just want the easy bite-sized thing, uh, the headlines, uh, despite all the challenges over the last two and a half years, uh, more venues have signed up at this stage in the run-up to Independent Venue Week than any other year previously. So we have already 207 venues, uh, 27 venues uh, out of those are taking part for the first time. 181 of those venues are blessedly outside of London. Uh, the oldest venue is St James's in Guernsey, and the smallest venue is the wonderful Greyston Unity in Halifax, which recently doubled its capacity. It's now a 35 cap. <laughs> and bless them for doing it. Well done. Yeah, a round of applause for the grace and unity. Yeah, you can imagine what the bosses at Six Music said when I said, yeah, let's take an independent venue. How much does it hold? 35. Uh, anyway, so it promises to be a big 10th anniversary. Uh, once again, uh, we should thank everyone who's kindly supporting the event. Uh, that includes uh, the Arts Council England, uh, BBC Six Music, Creative Scotland, uh, the ticketing partners C Tickets, the Mercury Music Prize, and PPL. More partnerships to be announced in due course. Uh, also, so now here's the thing. This year, there's going to be not just one, but two independent venue week ambassadors. We can confirm that the first of these ambassadors is Philip Selway from Radiohead, uh, who will be uh, one of the people uh, talking up the event and will also, in fact, uh, as part of it, will be doing his own solo tour during Independent Venue Week. He can't be here today, but he did send us this message. Hi, Steve. Hi, Sybil. And hello, everyone. Sad not to be with you, but uh, I hope you're all having a great time at the launch. So first, I'd like to thank uh, Sybil and everyone at, at IVW for inviting me to become an ambassador for this 10th anniversary Independent Venue Week. I feel honoured and excited to be part of it all. And I'd also like to celebrate everything that Sybil and IVW have achieved over this past decade. They've supported, promoted and nurtured many venues and artists all across the UK and not only that, but they've made for many memorable nights of music for gig goers. I think also, given the mayhem of the past few years, that live music in the UK needs IVW now more than ever. For me, independent venues are the lifeblood of music in the UK. They've given me so many opportunities throughout my musical life be that in Radiohead, in my solo work, or playing in other bands. And also, they've introduced me to so much great music that otherwise I wouldn't have come across. It's an incredible community of committed and inventive people that I am so grateful to be part of. I'm really looking forward to the shows that I'll be playing across uh, this upcoming Independent Venue Week, and then Beyond that, seeing what Sybil and IVW can achieve over this next decade. So thank you, 
and see you soon. Philip Selway, ladies and gentlemen. Do you know, I first properly met Radiohead uh, when they were on tour, and it was the first night, because they were travelling back from most of the places they were playing, back to Oxford. But this particular night, they stayed over in this very chintzy bed and breakfast in uh, Stoke. And can I just tell you, they are connoisseurs of wine. They went through the whole... They kept this poor night porter up uh, all night, uh, and, just going, and they did the whole... Mm, very good. Uh, yeah, that's my overriding Radiohead memory. Nothing to do with any of those big albums or anything. Just the wine tasting. They're very good at wine tasting. Um, so what we should do next, I, I guess, because um, Philip mentioned Sybil quite a lot, and uh, to go back, uh, seeing as we're 10 years into this caper now, we should probably find out where it all started and how things have changed. So we'd please welcome to the stage uh, founder of Independent Venue Week, Sybil Bell. Ten years, we've not aged a bit. <laughs> I'll pay you later, what, Steve. Um, what was it a decade ago then? What had you been doing before and why did you decide that you needed or the world needed this event? I think um, I'd owned a venue. You actually interviewed me on air. It was the first time I'd been interviewed on air when I owned Moles down in Bath. And it's bloody hard work. Um, but as a venue owner and operator, you tend to be quite invisible, which is kind of your job, really. Um, but having owned and run a venue, and you know, I looked at the record store day model and I thought, what a great opportunity to celebrate the people behind the scenes. So um, I thought it would be more appropriate to have a week worth of shows because what goes on in a venue changes across the week and the idea was born in an office that we were squatting in on Charing Cross Road the old EMI office actually and came up with the idea and I thought well, I'll see I'll see who's interested in this and uh, emailed a few venues around one told me it was an absolute waste of time it would never fly sucker um, but actually the response was really positive and the hardest venue to nail down was a London venue, actually. Uh, we ended up with a half moon in Putney. Um, uh, but the idea from the very start was to make sure that we had venues all around the country. I wanted it to feel very much like a national event. So um, we chose, <laughs> I thought we ought to just keep the Monday free so that it didn't start on the Monday, a bit of time for extra publicity. Turns out we didn't need that. But we did three venues a night across the first week, and we, we did one in various locations around the country. So I was thinking, like, if you say she Sheffield, where would you play? You'd play the Lead Mill. Um, so it was trying you know, Southampton, the joiners, just thinking about the, the venues that everybody knows. And because it was just me, I thought I'd keep it really simple. Everyone just to do one show a night. And then we announced at the end of... November, I thought we'd give ourselves a couple of months for some publicity, and the, the press on it just kind of went a bit crazy, which was good. Everyone, somebody actually said, oh, it's back again. And it felt like there was a real gap. Um, nobody was really shining a spotlight on the venues that we were all going to and loving. I mean, there were venue competitions, but I just... I don't get it. I don't see how somebody can say one venue is better than another. And I think it's better to celebrate all of them. They work together so closely. Um, so I set about trying to pull this together and get people on board, um, approached your team, you very kindly. I mean, if there was anywhere it was going to sit on radio, it was going to be with you, and you and your team very kindly um, were keen to support. I'll do anything to get out of the bloody <laughs> office, mate, to be fair. Um, and then uh, I asked Colin Greenwood, I just, well, actually, I said to him, I've come up with this new idea, what do you think? And he rung back and said, how can I help? At which point I was like, uh, would you play a show at the Jericho Tavern? It's like, no, fairly obviously. Um, but agreed to be ambassador. And again, I think, you know, this role of ambassador is so important. The venues have got a story to tell. Uh, and, and, and that's really our focus this year, is to get the venues to talk about what it means to them. But the ambassadors... Have their, have their take on it. They're the ones that tour around the country. They go on to play bigger venues. It's the venues themselves that stay the, the, small, you know, the small venues that they can't necessarily get bigger and attract um, you know, bigger capacity. So it's nice to have somebody else telling their stories. And Philip mentioned in that um, video that now more than ever, you need something like Independent Venue Week. Were you, particularly after the last two or three years, were you surprised by how many people have already signed up or have you got the feeling that actually this 
we could do some really good work here. We can help. We probably could help more than we could, you know, if it was five years ago. It does really feel like it, doesn't it? It's been, you know, we've spent a long time in the run-up to today trying to get the balance right between saying to venues, look, we know it's tough, we're not oblivious to that, but we also, I believe our role in being celebratory is to encourage people to go to gigs more. And if we can get people through the doors of gigs more, you know, if you go to a gig once a month, go twice a month. If you're going once a week, go twice a week. And really, it's about being proactive rather than reactive. So I think to have... I think it's about 217 venues have signed up already so far this year was really heartwarming for us because it's a, it's, a delicate, it's a delicate environment at the moment and we didn't want to feel like we were not sensitive to it. But if, we, if, the, if this number of venues are signing up, then they obviously want it, they can see the value. And, and it's on us now and everybody in this room that can help create some really amazing shows. If you've got artists, even if they're out of cycle, speak to the team, let's get some really magical moments going because if we can get people into venues at the start of the year, our research has shown that they'll keep coming back throughout the year. It's that first step of, you know, haven't been to a gig for a while, when's the best time to go? Well, actually, independent venue week's a great time. Yeah, I, make, I always make a really big push as well around Christmas. If you are, you know, you've got that mate and you've got no idea what to get him for Christmas, buy him a ticket. Yes. Just buy him a gig ticket. Buy him a gig ticket for something at Independent Venue Week. Cheap ticket, good night out. I mean, give him a cheap ticket and a five at the spend. That's, you know, nearly, what's that? That's nearly two thirds of a pint in London. <laughs> um, something like that. Yeah. But, you know, it just, it's encouraging. And that's the thing, as you say, get them there early. Do you, I mean, if it works and everyone was doing really well, would you stop? Or do you think you'll still be here in 10 years' time saying the same things, you know, supporting, supporting venues through either the same challenges or different challenges? Well, we've seen a massive change in challenges just in the last 10 years, getting people going to, to gigs and, you know, not relying on discovering new music on their screen has been a, a big challenge. We've got a generation for whom that's the, that's the deal. I, you know, everybody in this room is all too aware that actually the challenges that all the venues and our community has faced more broadly has been touring cost of living. We're seeing tours cancelled every day. We're trying, to, our goal is really to try and change people's mindsets. You know, when you're going to a venue to discover a new band, you want that I was there moment, really. So everybody's taking a risk, but none more so than the venues are saying, look, we're going to put this band on. I've no idea who's going to turn up, but be part of it. Don't wait until they've got bigger. Let's all be part of it. So I think I'd love to be here in 10 years time. It's a really big goal for us. We're not because we're a celebration, we should continue celebrating. And I think if we can get more people going through the doors, then we'll, you know, the venues will continue to, to, to benefit. And bringing through new generations of fans. This is an interesting thing, because talking of uh, music fans, one particularly well-known one who I first became aware of uh, when I was at a gig in Bristol watching the Archie, Archie Bronson outfit, I think. And there was, oh, there must have been, a, you know, there were about 60 people there, but there was one guy at the front for whom it looked like he was having the best night of his entire life. And then I saw him at another gig having the best night of his entire life. Uh, who went on to become your first non-musician ambassador, Big Jeff. Now, as, uh, as some of you probably know, uh, Jeff was quite badly injured uh, in a fire at his home back in June. Um, obviously, we've been thinking about him and people have been sending him messages. Uh, we thought, though, as a bit of a tribute, we'd give you an update uh, on how Jeff's recovery is going. Will you please welcome Jeff's manager, Lee Dodds? How, hi. How, so when was the last time you saw him? How is he? I saw Jeff last week. Um, he was in quite good spirits. So he's just started what we're sort of calling phase two of his recovery. So phase one was literally keeping him alive. So phase two is some reconstructive surgery, which is, you know, it's quite full on, quite hard going. But he needs to have some surgery to be able to extend his neck, which I keep saying so he can see the bands again. Yeah. So that's, that's his incentive. So... He's such a trooper, you know, he really is an inspiration to everybody. He doesn't feel sorry for himself. He feels really lucky to be alive. 
still feeling very connected with the world and really looking forward to getting back to Is that to partly gigs. because people have been sending in messages and stuff? So for, I, run, I run the art account for Jeff and then we started sort of obviously announcing on our socials the situation and I can't keep up with it. Every day we're having messages. We've had hundreds of thousands of messages of love and support for Jeff from all four corners of the world. It's, it's been overwhelming. And I know that Jeff keeps that in his heart every day. Yeah. And it must, well, I mean, it must be so hard for someone who's, I mean, his whole, I mean, his whole life revolved around live music. So being stuck in a bed and not being able to go out, I don't know how he's, how he's coping. Yeah, I mean, FOMO doesn't cover it. So. Right. <laughs> Yeah, he's, yes. he's still feeling connected and lots of Bristol bands have been in to see him. He's currently got um, an electric drum kit. which oh, I of... saw that. He's got an electric drum kit so he can do a solo gig for himself. What, <laughs> yeah. what is he learning? Does he know drums? Is he, just... he, do, he does. So it's he's right. a drummer. He's got his own band called The Outlines. So he's a drummer. And so obviously when he first moved out back into Bristol and to South Mead Hospital, he looked at me and said, I'd love an electric drum kit. And then I think the physio could see that actually Jeff needed a different way of connecting than maybe most other people might do. So he's been painting on his hospital window and now he's got his own drum kit which was um, lent to him by one of the psychologists. It's his son. So that's really? set up. So that's, that's going to be Jeff's physio to get, his, to get his hands and his arms and his body moving again. I hope he's got headphones. Has he got headphones? Of course he's What's got that? headphones. Yeah. There's, other, there's other patients there. <laughs> um, thank you very much. We, we do. Uh, obviously, we, we couldn't let up the, this opportunity pass uh, without just asking. And uh, we actually do have this message from the man himself. Hey, Sybil and everyone else at Independent Rainy Week. Um, I'm so glad I can't be with you at the launch. Obviously, I'm still stuck here in hospital recovering from a severe accident. Um, and I, I think it's amazing that you managed to uh, survive 10 years. I think in those 10 years, you provided um, really essential support for independent venues up and down the countries, and in which countless communities will be thankful for the work and effort and time that you've put in. Um, and keeping them alive, keeping them buzzing and flowing um, from, this, from like places like the windmill to like the trades club to all these really beautiful spaces which are invaluable parts of history really and also um, provide a lot of safe spaces for people like me to go and hang out in and communal hubs. What a legend. Jess Johns, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you're not expecting this, but it's my turn again, Steve. Um, if you have... If you have the opportunity to support Jeff on his website, he's um, got lots of prints and T-shirts on there. He'd really appreciate it. We wanted to do that for you, Steve, as a thank you for all your support for the last 10 years on air and on tour. So um, this is a gift for you from us via Big Jeff. Oh, I'm going to cry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody. I am, I am slightly moist of eye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And hopefully it won't be too long before we see you down the front with your sketch pad uh, and your uh, endearing style of headbanging. Uh, I guess um, from fans we should turn back to, uh, given that we've talked about them, the, the venues and the people who run the venues, sometimes it's quite, a, it's quite a lonely existence, I think. Sometimes people are doing it as a crusade, sometimes they're music fans. Let's find out why uh, these people are putting on gigs as part of Independent Venue Week this year. Uh, Don Fraser from the Boiler Room in Guildford, Nathan Clark from the Brudenell Social Club in Leeds, and from Woolwich Works, we have Sean Doherty. Please welcome to the stage. Everybody. Three lovely guests, only one microphone. So we'll do you in turns. Dom, 
You would, Dom, Dom, you were there right at the, the, the start. Where's your microphone? Just there. Uh, you were, weren't you there for the very first year of Independent Venue Week? Is that right? Yes, that's correct. We were. So what, when somebody, uh, or Sybil, or somebody said, we're going to do this thing, what did you think? You weren't uh, the one who said this will never fly. No, that wasn't me. Um, and I have this, so I've got some notes, because I'm not very good at public speaking. Um, I think we thought at the time, and we still do, that it's a great initiative. Um, I probably did a fist pump in the air or something like that. Um, I think encouraging the public uh, and our industry to hold space and celebrate indie venues um, and the people that work in them is really important. And I think in an ever sort of increasingly homogenized society to kind of celebrate what makes our spaces unique is actually really vital. Has it helped in the way that Sybil was mentioning? Does it, has it helped create uh, I don't know, environment where... Do, has it raised the awareness at a good time of year for you around Guildford? Oh, most definitely. I think most venues um, would historically not have too much on in January. It can sometimes be a tough time for us. So when we were um, approached and the initiative was started, to be able to have some really sort of focus for the team as well for that end of January was, was really great. And you've also, uh, one of the things, and this is beginning to happen a, around the country, you've sort of diversified the use of the space as, as well, haven't you? So you've, you've become known as, well, we can give you this sort of room as a start-up, you can do this, bringing in other creatives from around the musical community and elsewhere. Yeah, we, um, I suppose we don't see, um, well, when you're creative, it's not, as linear as just being a musician, it's art, it's, um, it's so many other creative practices. So I guess really for us, it was about and is about encouraging the scene as a whole. And that's, I think, what we do at the venue really, really well. Um, throughout um, the time where we were shut, we actually managed to um, acquire a second site and we opened a gallery and art space and 20 art studios above it. And the two sites really sort of cross-pollinate each other. You know, you've got artists like Crack Cloud that are kind of art collectives, and they do everything from art, music, and sort of creative performance. And I think very much that's where we see our future and, and the future of sort of being creative, I guess, is to yeah, kind of so have cross-pollination. Yeah, it's a centre. It's a centre for a lot more people, brings it, in more it, people. Yeah, it's not just music. Um, you know. I've got to ask you this thing, as you've been there since the very start. Highlights over the years? Have you got any highlights? Yes. Lucky you were forewarned, <laughs> weren't you? <laughs> we do. Um, uh, I was remembering uh, the UMIT 6 gig that we put on with IVW, and they were... Um, from Brooklyn's College, which is just around the corner from the venue. So to have them come in and sell out was amazing. Um, there's so many memories, it's so difficult to remember, but I think the great thing that we, IVW does is to sort of show the team that actually people really, really value, and, and industry like yourselves, just shining a light on, on us and what we do is, is really, really appreciated. Excellent. Uh, Nathan uh, is from... Has anyone been to the Brood and Ill? In, like, yes, a few times. You'll, you'll already know this. Uh, then it's a brilliantly run venue. Which, um, I think it's really... Because, again, very much like a lot of the places we're talking about, it's like very focused on the fans that go there. And talking of expansion, you added... I don't know how many years ago it is now, but you added a second room, didn't you? A second live room which was, I mean, planned within an inch of its life, the detail and research, but all focused on what will make a better night out for the audience. Yeah, and I think what we have to realise at that point, that was a real risk for us. That was our own capital, that's our own land, and that's one of the things that we focus on, I think, gives us the ability as a venue, because we own that freehold, to take those risks. But within it, it also... Um, allowed us, and this was, apart from the fire station in Sunderland, that's a newly built, it was the first newly built physical ground up venue for over 25 years at that point. Really? And when you look at it, it, it was one of them that we planned ourselves. It wasn't a, a utilised building. It gave us an opportunity to look at what the artist needs when you come in, where you walk in the venue. A little bit like this, where it's a great venue overall. But I think it also allowed us to think about things where 
what would the engineer want? What would everyone else in the position from the start of the chain of the artist coming in of the exact position of the sound desk in the center of the room and the, and the dimensions back? So it gives an ability to start and um, thinking about everything f from the start, essentially. Do you think that's key as well, though, and what um, uh, promoters like yourself are really good at is knowing the audience and knowing what the audience want and being a fan, but just being on the other side? It, it gave us an opportunity also to cement our future, I think, as a venue, to give an option of two rooms so people could, could return to the venue and play a different room, but also play something that gave better... Um, AV capabilities on other things that we could fine tune and see where we could do things better in little things, but also give a lifelong kind of uh, option to an artist coming and making a relationship with us, not only as a venue in one room, but re constantly returning and playing a different room and playing a different size capacity and making that thing of a, of a stepping stone with us, not only as a venue, but as a promoter and solidifying ourselves and working with a wider community on it and working with uh, youth and children groups and community focuses and other kind of days, record fairs, that we couldn't potentially do before that. And, uh, I mean... Um the, the the other thing I think when I think about the Brood and L is just you talk about community, but how how many people just would go just go there, just like going there? It becomes a meeting place, it becomes a creative hub, it becomes all these things. And I don't know, is that shared around? Because it seems very community spirited. Leads in general is everyone, all the venues and places. Does does everyone sort of on the same side? That's what it feels like. In a lot of ways, yes. And I can look around certain faces in the room now where I go, you know, there's, there's, there's venues where we're programming into new artists, whether it be Hyde Park Book Club or a new venue, Mill Hill Chapel, where we're putting shows in there. Um, and you've got to support them for the growth and realise that, that we're all in this kind of pathway together, this ecosystem you talk about and the synergy that we go, go through. And... I think it isn't just that, it, it, it is programming, whether it is the youth children's gigs or the piano sessions that we do, and just even the, the ways that I talk about where Joe, who's in with IVW now, who was you know, a student, worked at a local venue up the road, came to work with us, now he's uh, the head of IVW here. It, it creates a pathway through for the people that work there, the musicians that work behind the bar that are the, the gig economy, as we talk it, I, I look at it and I say, we own this, we can give something back as a community that we're what you might call lifers in this industry, you know. <laughs> we're, we're not going anywhere, we might as well make the best of our home. We're not an investment company that's trying to make a, a shed into something for the next five years. Yeah. It, it's ours and we own it and we want to make it the best experience for the artist, the public and everyone that works there across the journey. Uh, one independent venue week highlight? Probably, I think it might have been 2013, and, and Tom Tom Club came and played. No way, really? Yeah. Tom Tom Club? It might have been 2014, I can't remember the exact date, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's... that's a they turned up a day before, because they didn't have anywhere to stay on the bus, and we had to look after them for two days. So it was quite nice hanging out with Chris and Tina and people like yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Taking them to the local curry house, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's one you won't forget. Anyway. Thank you. Uh, that's Nathan. Anyway. Now, Sean... Tell us about Hello. Woolwich Works. Uh, Woolwich Works is, I think, one of the two newest venues, I think, taking part. Yeah. Uh, whereabouts is it? How big is it? And why on earth did you get involved in this? Um, so, yeah, Woolwich Works, brand new venue. Um, we just celebrated our first anniversary. Um, so in Woolwich in South East London. Um, yeah, good question. Why would you open a new venue during a pandemic? Yeah. In Had you promoted or done anything in live music before? Me personally? Yeah. Um, I'd, b before this, I'd worked at Handel and Hendrix, which is the museum in central London where Jimi Hendrix lived, and the composer Handel. Great pub quiz question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we, I used to kind of program and run events and parties and stuff there, but obviously on a much smaller scale. So... Um, no, but yeah, Woolwich Works is this series of buildings um, which used to be part of the Royal Arsenal in South East London. So these beautiful historic brick buildings um, which were kind of falling into disrepair and they were owned by Greenwich Council. 
And somebody went around and looked at these spaces and went, they, these would be amazing gig spaces and rehearsal spaces. So they put a lot of money into making them into a state-of-the-art new venue um, with lots of different spaces. So we've got a, one main space called the Fireworks Factory because they used to make fireworks there, among other things. Um, and then we've got different rehearsal spaces and smaller venues as well. So um, we could do all sorts of things, basically. What, uh, if, anyone, um, if anyone asks, because uh, we're always trying to encourage new promoters and people to find spaces where you can put artists on, what are the, what are the first hurdles that you had to cross when you started? Is it persuading, uh, is it you know just finding artists to play? Is it persuading agents that they should take your phone call? What is, what is it? Yeah, I think it's all those things. So, you know, we've been open a year. We've started to make inroads. So, you know, we were part of London Jazz Festival um, last year, and then we're continuing that this year. So we've got Fergus McCready, who is nominated for a Mercury, and um, Rosie Freighter-Taylor, who's an amazing singer-songwriter, was played a really small one of our smaller spaces last year and has now moved on to the bigger space. So, yeah, I think it's just slowly and making are, are, are you finding an audience? And is that audience travelling from all over London or are you finding a local audience that, uh, obviously, you know, Nathan and Dom are talking about is bringing the local people together? Yeah, good question. Um, so I think we've, we've managed to build a really great hardcore following among people who live in Woolwich and Greenwich and Charlton, the local area. So they're like big supporters of ours. They'll be going really regularly. So we do comedy, music, theater, all sorts. So they'll be going to all sorts of things just because it's in the local area. And it has been harder to reach out to the wider London area. So that's kind of like what we want to do next. But now the Elizabeth line is open. That's kind of really been a kind of turning point for us. So yeah. Uh, and what are you planning for Independent Venue Week this year? Do you start off with a hit list of things, uh, thinking, well, we could, we could take a chance or two with this? Yeah, well, we've got one booked in, um, a band called All Day Breakfast Cafe, which is one of the best names I've had in a long while, um, who have billed themselves as South London's um, favourite they, disco band. Yeah, I was going to say, they're the disco <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, look them up. They are, and it is right, old school disco. They play Brixton Windmill quite a lot, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And, but they're like amazing jazz musicians, all female, but they've kind of made this side project of just like, yeah, classic disco tunes, and that'll be amazing, I think. Excellent. And well, I'll listen, enjoy it. Uh, I hope, uh, yeah, and I, I, hope it, I hope it's an amazing success for, for everyone here. Uh, please, a round of applause for all our promoters. <laughs> Because without them, we wouldn't have places to go and we wouldn't discover things that we wouldn't usually discover. I think that's one of the things I always... I'm always very grateful to everyone who's put on gigs, which I've been to by bands that I may have heard their record, might have heard, you know, a demo or something. But really, I judge on, oh, you know, have they got any more songs? Are they good live? What does an audience look like when the audience is watching the band? And that none of this would happen unless someone took the risk and put this band on or someone built a reputation where you thought well I don't know the band but I'll go along anyway it's the people who are doing all this uh, quite often for very little reward and constantly uh, on the uh, cusp financially it's these people who I respect more than any I've, I've told you all the one time I tried to promote a gig have I told you that story Harlow Square uh, I used to live and work in Harlow um, I was the sports editor of the Harlow Gazette for two years. Uh, during that time, Harlow, the square in Harlow is an amazing venue, um, but there was a point where the students were going to be on holiday and Mac, who, who was the guy, he was an amazing guy, he was the regular promoter, and he said, I've got this idea, we'll put an all-dayer on, we'll put all the brilliant local bands on and we'll have one headliner, one big headliner. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Okay, so, so bands literally from about half 12 right through to midnight. And we had a budget of £400 for the headliner. This is, I think, 1989. Um, and we, we narrowed it down to two bands that we could choose from. Uh, and I'd just been on tour with one of them, and they were just been on the cover of The Enemy. Uh, and there was quite a lot of hype around them. Um, and then there was the other bands who 
uh, came from up north and they'd had an album out, but the album hadn't really done that much. It had quite good reviews. I mean, it was a grower, but you know, in terms of profile, the other band didn't have it. And the other band wanted 450 pounds. So that's how I ended up booking Birdland instead of the Stone Roses. <laughs> and why I will never make a promoter. Right, we're coming to the final part of uh, uh, the proceedings. Um, obviously, something like this, you can't make an impact with an event like this without some outside help. So uh, here's some people who are helping from outside uh, of uh, live music in a way uh, and are coming up with uh, support in different ways, including, importantly, cash. Uh, so, uh, will you welcome to the stage Arts Council England's Adrian Cook. Also, Kelly Betts and Jesse Zatch from BBC Introducing. And our special guests from the States, Reverend Moose. Um, thank you for the money. Um, right. You're welcome. Arts, Ca Arts Council England. I mean, Arts Ca the Arts Council England have been involved with, well, obviously, all uh, you know, helping to fund all manner of arts. I mean, music, music was slightly late to the pot of money, but it has become so important uh, for the British music industry, hasn't it? At grassroots level, having a bit of cash, either to expand the vision of what people want to do, or just keep the lights on. Yeah, I think I think the traditional view of um, the music industry, certainly from public funding, was that it was a commercial enterprise and so should wash its face. I mean, when I started at Arts Council seven years ago, that that had already shifted a bit in terms of artists getting development funds themselves. But I had noticed, which is pertinent to this, that um, the venues weren't really applying, or you know, independent music venues weren't applying at all. Um, which seemed odd, and you know, we, we did what we could to try and rectify that. But ultimately. Where that went was that we actually started a, a fund just for venues called Supporting Grassroots Live Music, which we launched at Great Escape. That must have been three and a half years ago now. Um, I don't know why necessarily they weren't um, applying before. I don't know if it was either bad experience in the past or maybe the perception was that Arts Council wouldn't fund those sorts of venues. Is the form too long? Yeah, I suppose so. But, you know, I don't know how else you... Uh, I mean, I've never got money from anywhere without filling in some sort of form, you know, so I don't know how... But I, I get the point. But I think it, it sounds like it was more that they didn't think it was the sort of thing that, that we would fund, you know. But once the, the fund st uh, started, there was specifically four venues. So they were only in competition, effectively, with themselves or those working with venues. And then working with organisations like Independent Venue Week and Music Venue Trust to get the message through that, you know, this, this, there was funding available... That's, that's shifting. Now, unfortunately, of course, we were interrupted by COVID right in the middle of that happening. But having said that, there's been lots of great successes of um, venues and initiatives like this one that have been funded, so which, is, which is good so for us. Do you think, because you've been involved, the Arts Council have been involved with Independent Venue Week since something like year two or something like that. Do you think that has helped translate what you can do? So obviously, you can help an event like this has made people turn around and go, oh, OK, right, I, I, I've got this. It's not just for things that have no relevance to me. I think so. I think there's definitely some of that. But also, I think, I mean, in many ways, I may not be typical of people that have worked at the Arts Council before I was there. But I, mean, I think that's generally changing. And I think that's part of a process where perhaps the Arts Council is understanding the sector a bit more and vice versa. So I think it's part of an ongoing process, really, where you know each other kind of works out um, how we can work together. And I think that'll, that'll continue for many years, really. How much, how much were you aware, you mentioned COVID, but how much were you aware that at that point, your direct financial help was, as I say, keeping the lights on for some people? Oh, yeah, no, very much. I mean, I was really impressed how quickly Arts Council sort of moved to set up an emergency fund um, before we'd even got the cultural recovery fund. And that, so that was literally us pressing pause on all of our lottery funding and saying, no, this is, this is just for, you know, people need to stay afloat. Fortunately, the process of those venues applying for our other fund had started, so a lot of those venues are in the system already. Um, but, you know, absolutely. I mean, we are speaking to venues on a, you know, sort of daily basis about, obviously, you know, the problems that were happening immediately and, and how far before, literally, yeah, as you say, the lights go off. 
So moving moving on from uh, there, um, do, you, do you envisage uh, continuing with the support or expanding the support or you know looking into other ways where uh, you can help young musicians and young promoters? And venues generally, you mean? Venues, yeah. and venues I, I mean, I think, um, you know, no one's get all kind of corporate about it, but Arts Council launched its new 10-year strategy of investment last year called Let's Create. And for my money, um, it's venues, um, particularly, you know, small grassroots venues, have never been better aligned with Arts Council's kind of um, investment ambitions, actually. So I'd say there's lots of opportunity for venues to get a slice of that pie because the work that they do is so important. It's so important to, you know, people's first engagement of any culture. It certainly was mine. I mean, I literally, you know, almost literally grew up inside, you know, small venues, whether it was Norwich Arts Centre or Cambridge Portland Arms or whatever. So you know, they're really important and I think they'll only continue and I think, you know, our relationship is at a relatively early early stage but I, th I can see that continuing for a long time. I very much hope it does. It sounds like it's very in line with some of the things which Dom and, um, and Nathan were talking about as well, Expand, you know, expanding into other areas yeah. of art. Uh, Kelly and Jess, hello. Come forward, come forward, take a microphone. You've only got one between two. Just in case people Sorry. don't know what BBC Introducing does, uh, in, I mean, I'm sure you've done this a thousand times, uh, explain what BBC Introducing is there for and what it aims to achieve. So in short, BBC Introducing is the best thing in the world. <laughs> In Long, it supports uh, new musicians from their hometown. They can upload to their local shows, just like Angel's in Suffolk or Abby's in Kent or Jess is here in London. And they get heard by their local shows and then sent up to people like you, Steve, who, and then you go on to play them. And we also um, help those artists play bigger, net, you know, bigger stages like Glastonbury, Reading and Leeds. Do you think there's quite a similarity between what you do, which is putting bands, I guess, on the first step of the radio ladder, uh, and what venues are doing, what the venues that are going to be involved with this are doing, which is giving people the first step on the live ladder? Oh, 100%. It goes hand in hand in nurturing artists, doesn't it, and bringing them through, whether that's through radio or, yeah, through the live scene. And before the uploader existed, how we all found new music was going down to the venues and watching artists. I'm sure that's how you still find find your new music as well on Passage? I think there is um, a difference. We were talking about this earlier, actually, in that we, people like me and the rest of the introducing team go to these venues. So almost like the venues come first uh, and we see these artists firsthand. And I think a lot of people who are passionate about music and working in music will say that live music is one of the most important things to the artist, to them, like where they really see it come to life. Artists can't always afford to put together a radio-ready track, so I guess introducing can swoop in there and play demos and it not sound out of place. But really, I think radio's almost like reaching wider audiences or reaching audiences that maybe can't make it down to that local little gig. It's it's a discovery in a different way. It's just reaching a new artist. And so do you audience. think it still rings true that presenters a more confident, uh, not just, you can discover something that's true, but a more confident having seen an artist excel live than they would be had they not seen them. Yes, it is literally where you see them come to life. You see them in real life, like, like we've seen over the past few years without gigs, without seeing your friends, without seeing people in real life. You know, you just know it's not the same, is it? Like, you need to see them live. And again, like, you can listen to these tracks and just have it as a nice soundtrack, but then when you really plug in and actually see them perform live, 3D, it's just it's like where the heart is, isn't it? How many shows are there around the country? 38? Is it 30? 30? 35. Some of them have merged. Some of them have merged? In a coup, we're coming for you. Well, like Devon and Cornwall are now one show. Right, so okay. So, but, so it's 35. Do those, uh, do those shows keep in touch with their local venues then? Is there yeah, a good connection? Yeah, 100%. Like right now in the audience, sorry to be embarrassing, but there's Honor from Beds, Hearts and Bucks introducing standing right behind Luke who runs the horn. So that just shows how in unison they are across the country. Yeah, that is, that's great. And, and uh, do you think, I mean, I, I got the impression a little bit and I was involved with BBC Introducing at the, at the very start and its launch. 
But I got the feeling at the very start that it was seen as, why would we send music to the BBC? It was seen as a bit too establishment and a bit stuffy. Uh, and it's just not very rock and roll, I think, all those years ago. Whereas now, do you think with the success that you've had with certain artists, it, that has changed? Yeah, 100%. Like the artists that are coming through, um, they are still rock and roll, but they're also, you know, there's, there's such a varied amount of artists coming through, all genres. Um, like, you know, there's Lynx at the moment, they're phenomenal, played our stage at Reading and went viral. We've got Grove, who also played our stage at Reading, just amazing, like hip hop producer, like, yeah. There's um, PV Wonders as well, who I sent you actually from Newcastle. So there's just loads of like artist, like brilliant artists coming through, and yeah. success stories of building. <laughs> Sorry, was that boring? <laughs> this this <laughs> is going to be a very long list. <laughs> I know. I don't know when to stop. But yeah, we like you know success yeah. stories are being built all the time, yeah, yeah. and is being brought back to introducing each time. So, yeah. What would you like? I just wanted to say though, Steve, you skimmed over really, really quickly your your introducing story, but. Florence and the Machine was brought through through you on introducing, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did. <laughs> yeah, we 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 had a little budget that year to take <laughs> to take an artist to the South by Southwest Festival, and yeah, off the back of what seemed like a really good demo, um, yeah, we chose Florence. Florence, <laughs> we chose we chose Florence. I met. Uh, this is a very long story, but I met Florence's dad uh, at a function which I was attending with Felix from the Maccabees, <laughs> uh, where lots of Florence's family was and was just hauled around from weird relation to another relation with this guy going, oh, yes, Martha. No, no, this is the DJ chappy. Come over here. Come over here. This is the, D now, this is the DJ. He's the one who broke Flo's career and spent, <laughs> spent yeah, 15 minutes being pushed, pushed around from pillar to post. But that was BBC introducing. Couldn't have done it any other way. It just gave a stage. And it was a live gig, really, which broke her, first of all. Yeah. It's a very good point. Thank you very much for making that. I will really do the same for you one day. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jess and Kelly. And for now, this is going on in the States now. So it started here 10 years ago. Uh, now, Moose, you've taken up the, the flag for Independent Venue Week in America. Uh, what made you want to get involved? How did you hear about what was happening over here and what made you want to get involved in the States? Well, <clears throat> all roads point to Sybil, right? I've been friends with Sybil for many, many years. And for a few years, we had just talked back and forth about how do we bring this to the US? It's always been an ambition of hers to be able to go outside of just the UK. And we never really found the right model. And then one day, as friends do, I was crashing on her couch and just woke up and said, fuck it. Like, let's just do it. Let's just commit. And so we happened to be uh, aligning with the fifth anniversary in the UK uh, when we were rolling out in the first. So we felt like there was a little bit of a press nugget there to be able to latch onto. And when we sent out our first press release, it got picked up by a couple of the trade magazines. And what we saw was uh, a few very important independent venues from the US had actually reached out and said, hey, I've been keeping an eye on this, and I've been waiting for it to come to the States. We want to be involved. So I've been watching the, the slideshow that was playing earlier about the progressive growth of it. And we very much modeled the entire launch and growth of the American version of this off, or, off of what the, Sybil and her team did. So I think our first year, I think we had 18 venues, again, across all of both major and secondary and tertiary markets. Um, and, uh, and now we have, um, so, sorry, Sybil, we have more, almost twice as many venues participating. But we don't have anywhere nearly as many Radiohead members helping out. <laughs> so in that regard, you guys are, are definitely two upping us. Um, but we have, we, for the last two years, we're very proud. We've had uh, venues and promoters in literally every single state, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico, taking part, which is, uh, you know, if you're familiar with the American geography, it's not easy to find any business that is still able to compete on a on a local level in some of these markets because it's just uh, you know everything's being crushed economically, uh, logistically, from from 
so many different reasons, and every market is different. Is, I mean, are the problems facing American venues, are, they, are some of them exactly the same? I mean, over here, we would, you know, point at, I don't know, council red tape, uh, complaints from neighbors about noise. Is it exactly the same type of thing, or are there yeah. different challenges in the yeah. States? I mean, look, it's 100% identical, right? And at the same time, it's completely different. And I think every, every independent venue in any part of the world is going to see the parallels, and they'll also see the differences. And um, one of the, you know, like for, as we started doing this in Independent Venue Week would grow, right? You know, I think us with our preconceptions as far as what this business might need versus what that might need. And one place it really was uh, support with a local council, right? And it was just in general, like this is gonna be rezoned or uh, we're gonna take away a tax benefit or not give a tax benefit or whatever a case might be. And then in another one, it could be um, there's a foreign national company that's essentially squeezing out the, the business in that area, or another one might be about, um, you know, historic preservation. So everything is completely different, right? Some of them are liquor law related, some of them are nightlife related, some of them are uh, just, um, you know, shit happens related. And uh, and so you have to be able to to modify the different strengths, but you also have to be able to lean on each other and learn from those. And so we've been able to learn a great deal off of the UK and everything that's been happening here. And uh, you know, hopefully we, some of those victories that we've had have been able to come back as well. And certainly once everything shut down, it was uh, everybody figure it out and let's see what the tools are that we have available. Despite not having the radio heads, uh, so have you found that as you know, in the last however long it is now, five years or so, the, there is people understand what it is and are keen to support? It. Y yes. I mean, though I would love to work with Radiohead, if any of the other three <laughs> members are hearing this, uh, we were very happy to launch with uh, Chuck D from Public Enemy and Prophets of Rage as our original artist ambassador. Uh, and we've had um, Fantastic Negrito. We had Allison from The Kills and, and Dead Weather. Last year, we had Big Frida, who, uh, who was performing as our artist ambassador. And we didn't know at the time that she had committed that she'd be coming out with a Beyonce single like a month before, not even a month, two weeks before Independent Venue Week in the US. So obviously, there's been a significant amount of, of support. And we have benefited from that greatly. As, as much as this is a program to support independent businesses for us, we don't have the national, we don't have arts programs, right? We, we, we are devoid of that uh, as a culture. And for us, this is really a marketing initiative. It is a presentation. It's about differentiating th this room, which is, by the way, not just an amazing room, but the entire staff here since I showed up has been fantastic. So thank you guys. You've been great. Uh, but differentiating this room from one down the street where it is the same as pulling up in Manchester or wherever else you could be, because truly that wherever else is defining that you are getting the same generic or sometimes, uh, you know, stale, uh, you know, experience. There is personality here. You know that, uh, I, I, I was backstage, so I don't know who was saying it, but yeah, you can build a room to your specific desires. You can build it as a standing room. You can build it as a listening room. You can build it as a comedy room. There's so many different things that you can take into consideration for your own personal interest. And without the independent spaces, we will have no rising cultures we will, we will continue to see the historically excluded artists and communities uh, be absent from the larger dialogue. And so it's important, not just from uh, a business and economic standpoint, uh, but it's also important from a representation standpoint that we as a community are able to support businesses and structures that are able to, to shine light on uh, people, individuals, and communities that, that have been historically excluded and that are leading the cultural discussions and evolution of what we're all benefiting from in the end. I think that's a really good point. It's not these places, um, and even this week, it's not independent venue week, it's not just about new bands, it's not just about new artists, although it's a very powerful tool for bringing artists um, onto a stage in front of some people, but it's about people who you know, have marginalised or slightly marginalised audiences, you know, smaller audiences, but people who've got, people who've got something to, 
share. It's just not, it's not inside the mainstream. And there's lots of music and poetry and stuff which is outside the mainstream and won't fill the Hammersmith Apollo, but will pull 200, 250 people who want to come together and share some ideas and, you know, maybe plot the revolution in the bar after the gig or on the bus home. I think that's the... That's a very important point, actually. Very important. Um, well, just very quickly, my, um, how do you see it growing in the States? And do, does the American record, broader record industry understand what you're trying to do and how important these places are? So um, if, I could, if I could give a somewhat long answer to this. We had a bit of an evolution I'm on I'm on air side. at four. That's all you've got to worry about. This clock stops. So you have until this clock says four o'clock. Uh, the... Um, at the start of the pandemic, right as South by Southwest was canceled, which was the first U.S. national event to be, major event to be canceled, we felt as the um, uh, stewards of independent venues in the community that we had to do something on behalf of the venue. So we started organizing uh, what would become a weekly town hall with our community. So we sent it out to all of our venues and, and um, you know, ticketing partners and uh, everyone involved and basically said, look, we're going to do this call. Nobody knows what's happening. Let's get on it. And that turned into essentially a, uh, a safety, right, for everybody to gather around. It was a, a few weeks later where legislation came back on a national basis where we realized that um, you know, th this business model was excluded. And you know, being the first businesses to close, mandated closure, and absolutely going to be the last ones to open, the two and a half month safety net that was being put out through the American uh, government was not going to be enough to get us anywhere near where we expected to be, which, by the way, was three months at the time. So, um, you know, myself and a number of different other people within those independent venue week town hall calls uh, created the National Independent Venue Association, NEVA, and started the Save Our Stages campaign. And that Save Our Stages campaign turned into a piece of legislation, which we ultimately got uh, with uh, bipartisan support, was the only industry carve out, in addition to the airlines, because uh, they always get industry carve-outs, that was actually passed into the Economic Recovery Program at the end of 2020, uh, 2020. And so we ended up securing a $16 billion program that helped save the independent venues, independent festivals, managers, booking agents, theaters, museums, zoos, aquariums, and it was all led from the owners and the operators of independent venues and festivals. So as much as everybody here in this business can often feel marginalized or outsidered, um, you know, this was very much a us leading and the general accepted arts culture following. Um, and so we, we were successful in securing the largest arts and culture funding in American history by far, I mean by a huge factor. And um, I think it's something like 25 times the annual budget of the National Endowment of the Arts uh, or the amount of money they've ever gotten ever. So it's a, it's a pretty significant success story. And, and so through the existence of NEVA, which I'd been, co I'd been running at the same time as my own business in Independent Venue Week, uh, we now have a, um, uh, an institutional representation in addition to the marketing, the promotional, the more consumer-facing representation. So when you talk about what does the future look like, I think for us, it's, it's difficult to look at without finally seeing the connection between the legislation and the representation from a governmental perspective, as well as culture and development and entertainment and all of the other aspects. But we weren't able to look at it like that before. It didn't exist. So over the last few years that we've been able to do that, uh, and it was a lot of work. I, I weighed as much as you do uh, when we started this. And, and, and so it's been a lot of stress as well. But um, you know, we've been able to preserve, and, and I'm just going to ramble for another second. We were, during the entire Save Our Stages campaign, we were very particular in the language we did not use. Watching Big Jeff um, talk about the value of, of the spaces and being in a situation where he is, he is essentially uh, fighting against, uh, it, it is a survival, a fight for survival. And, you know, I feel the same way he does in that regard. Like this to me was about we need a future. But we, you can't use language like life or death 
when people are dying by the millions. Uh, and, and so like, we were very sensitive to that fact. And hearing him be in the situation that he's in, using the same language that we all feel, uh, it really just brought like that it, it's, it's tough to hear. Uh, and it's tough to hear in that context. But I think we all n notice, I mean, like listen to your stories. Like every single one of them is a, is a, a moment. It's like a nugget of history that only you had access to and a couple other hundred people that have completely different stories. Like that, that is our lives, that's, that's it. That's why we keep waking up. And it is, um, that to me is what the future looks like, right? If we can give somebody else a reason to go on to the next day, if we can, if we can do something that allows them to be able to wake up and be excited, I'm, that's the only future I want to be able to see. Here, here, so that moves, ladies and gentlemen. And that is it. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for... Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, obviously, if there is uh, anything, I hope we've explained a bit about where it started, where it's come from, where it may be going, what it involves, who's involved with it. If there are any other questions, uh, just ask Sybil or one of Sybil's team. That's right, isn't it? You've, yeah, I just, you know, anything yeah. else that anyone wants to know? You'll be here. Oh, I just wanted to say a massive thanks to the team at IVW. I'd like to thank Joe, Erin, Sam. I'd like to thank Lou, who's joined us recently, who runs the Independent Venue Community Program. I'd like to add, help thank Adam and Debbie, who do our press, and Jill, who's joined us recently, um, Brian, who does all our partnerships, and Will, and all of our reps around the country. And massive thanks to you, Steve, for making sure that this stays at the forefront of people's minds on Six Music, because it makes a huge, huge difference to everyone. Okay. Desperate to be out of the office. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Mine's a half. See you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.